I don't think most people assume the future king um, spends his nights, um, you know, in, in cold sweats thinking about the debt. But Brownlow is one of a number of people alongside the Saudi and uh, HBJ, the former, former Qatari PM, who he's turned to in order to bail out um, his, his, his actually quite financially troubling situation. Where to start, really? Um, what's been, what was the trigger of your particular interest in Prince Charles and his finances? Uh, you know what? It all came about um, by, by accident, as many of the best stories do. Um, Henry Zeffman and I uh, were looking into um, the Tory party chairman, Ben Elliott. Um, and readers may recall last year that we did a story revealing that a Tory donor um, had paid Ben Elliott's company, his concierge business, quintessentially, and off the back of that, uh, booked to go on a private jet up to Charles's beloved estate in Scotland, Dumfries House, and have uh, dinner with the future king. Um, and off the back of this, um, we got a load of tips from people saying this sort of syndicate where the world's wealthy people um, can pay fixers or intermediaries and get in a room with HRH... I mean, you haven't even got a fraction of how big and institutionalised this all is. And we ended up, um, I ended up spending a lot of time at a, um, uh, basically poring over hundreds of documents that showed that Charles's closest confidant, uh, the notorious Michael Fawcett, and uh, a load of fixers, fixers had secured an honour for this Saudi billionaire that's now under police investigation, but that was basically our way in. And since then, we've been marinating in the world of royal sleaze, and it, um, it, it, it makes politics look clean, to be frank. And th so let's let's work through some of them first of all. So the the uh, the, the Saudi tycoon Khalid bin Mahfouz gave one and a half million pounds to a charity associated with Prince Charles, and then subsequently got a CBE. That's now being investigated by the police. Then uh, there was your revelation what, a week ago that, about this million pounds in an, a suitcase from Sheikh Hamad bin Jassim, former Prime Minister of Qatar. That's that's being in the the, the, the charity that was uh, was a total of three million pounds in all uh, between twenty eleven and twenty fifteen. They're now saying, "Oh, that was all in the past. It was a long time ago, half a decade ago, no a less. whole half a yes. decade ago." Yeah, and they definitely wouldn't take money in suitcases now. If it was a year, if it was a year ago, they'd have said it was a tenth of a decade ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, and now, just yesterday, another revelation. This this time involving Lord Brownlow, who listeners will remember. Uh, was the guy who offered to pay for the gold wallpaper in number 10. More recently, was being lined up to stump up £150,000 to build a treehouse for Boris Johnson at Chequers. Not for Boris Johnson, for his son. Um, although, I mean, I mean, you never know. <laughs> Key distinction. You yeah. can't uh, rule it out. Explain what's going on with this story. How's Lord Brownlow now now moved from politics into the, the, the Prince Charles story? I mean, he's a fascinating man, Lord Brownlow. But he, he, he basically has this decade-long pattern of conduct of bailing out extremely powerful and influential but occasionally cash-strapped people you mentioned the boris um his relationship with boris he also was the white knight that rescued david cameron's wife samantha's fashion company when it was hemorrhaging five hundred thousand pounds a year he took a 10 percent stake in that and then we revealed yesterday he'd also been bailing out prince charles i mean one of the weird one of the sort of interesting structural factors over here that people probably wouldn't assume is Charles doesn't have that much money. Um, it was actually in 2007 that he took out a £20 million loan in order to buy Dumfries House. It was going to be bought by an American buyer. Charles said to his friend, the Marquis of Butte, I'll put together some money, let me save it for the nation. Since then, it's been the sort of headquarters of his philanthropic empire and his weekend estate. Uh, but he's basically struggled to pay the debt back ever since. He actually told an ITV documentary in 2012 that the debt kept him up at night. I don't think most people assume the future king um, spends his nights, um, you know, in, in cold sweats thinking about the debt. But Brownlow is one of a number of people alongside the Saudi and uh, HBJ, the former, former Qatari PM, who he's turned to in order to bail out um, his, his, his actually quite financially troubling situation. Let's just focus on Dumfries House for a moment. I think we've got a clip of this is Prince Charles speaking to the BBC's Hidden Heritage in 2011 about why he wanted to take on that task of restoring Dumfries House. When I'd heard about this house, you see, um, that there was difficulty with it and that they wanted to sell it and find uh, a solution. But unfortunately, it, uh, it, didn't, it didn't happen. 
And I remember trying four years before it actually came up for sale as a problem. I tried to find a way of seeing if we could help sort it out or find somebody who might help, a, a sponsor, a donor, whatever. But it was just such an enormous task. An enormous task, which has sort of got him into trouble. I suppose, is the starting point with this, is that Prince Charles wants to do good things. His heart's in the right place, maybe. You know, there's this house it needed restoring. Uh, you know, or we'll come on in a minute and talk about the the the, the, the knock room uh, development as well. But he starts off with like, this is a good thing to do. But like you said, he doesn't have any of his own money, so he ends up getting into bed with people that probably, when it's on the front of a national newspaper, it looks like it would be better if he hadn't done that. That's a great analysis. I think another thing as well is that it's not only that he wants to do good things and has in good intentions when it comes to those good things. Um, he doesn't respect the constitutional convention whereby even if he happens to have opinions, he doesn't act on them. I think this is probably the problem at the heart of it. For two decades, three decades, Charles has been um, you know, lobbying and advocating for causes close to his heart. Some of them perfectly laudable, like restoring a dilapidated, beautiful 18th century Palladian manor. Others probably a little less laudable, like lobbying for homeopathic treatments to be made available on the NHS. But in a way, it kind of does a disservice to the debate to focus only on the weird and wacky things that he lobbies for. I mean, I've, I do think his Foundation for Integrated Health is probably the most notorious, but he's also lobbied against modern architecture, which he happens to dislike. But even if it's great stuff, it's the fact that he thinks he feels this entitlement to lobby and advocate on behalf of his causes. That's why he set up all these charities. I mean, it's not a normal thing. The Queen doesn't have, you know, charities through which tens of millions pass and go on to causes close no, to her What she does is she's the patron of existing charities, and which sort of bestows support upon them, but she's not involved in the, the fundraising and the day-to-day -day running of them. Exactly. I, I, and it, it's funny, like, in, in the newsroom, we often reflect on the word charity, but the moment that you introduce that word into a piece of journalism, people think, oh, well, it must be good then. I mean, the charity is just a legal structure that allows people to do things in the world, uh, to pursue objectives that the charity deems to be charitable. But the question is, is it right for Charles to be intervening in the world in this way? And I suppose that's the thing, isn't it? Is that by pursuing good things, you know, he likes the environment, he likes, you know, building houses for communities. And people, well, who could object to that? And the point is that actually if you're observing the constitutional uh, um, uh, rule or the constitutional norm that you don't have an opinion on anything then being for or against nice houses is not something that he should necessarily be sticking his oar into. Yeah, I mean, during the um, we, we only know this because of the Guardian's years-long legal case, but I mean, he lobbied new Labour ministers on any everything from army helicopters to the Patagonian toothfish. I mean, he basically just has lots of big opinions, yeah. and he acts on them, and, 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 and nowhere is his opinion about how the world ought to be more visible than in Dumfries. This is basically his... Charles HQ. I mean, Clarence House is his London base, but in terms of where he goes to be at peace with the world, where he feels like his values are exhibited to visitors and to all those who pass through. I mean, Dumfries House is, is the place, so you're right to identify that this is kind of the blank canvas on which Charles has attempted to ch make an indelible impact. What does Clarence House say about all this, apart from, I imagine, being annoyed that you keep phoning them on a Friday afternoon and saying, oh, I've got another donor that I've got some questions about. Do they feel like uh, they they have questions to answer, that this is an issue? Are they trying to sort of clean things up a bit? Great question. They're certainly annoyed. Um, you mentioned, uh, Roy mentioned a few moments ago, Michael Fawcett's resignation. I mean, there are five investigations. We should explain, Michael Fawcett was like the closest aide to Prince Charles. Yeah, he'd been forced to resign twice from Clarence House. He came back again and again. I mean, he was the man that could make things happen for HRH. He was the person who gave effect to Charles's will in the world. And off the back of our story last year, he quit, most presumed for the last time. A lot of one royal insider said to me he was extremely conspicuous by his absence at the Queen's recent Jubilee. People would usually go to him to get seats. He, he wasn't even at the event. What did Clarence House say? Their steadfast position, in particular on the honours question, um, which is obviously so toxic for him because it's the literal police involved, is that he had no idea about any of it. Um, and often the Clarence House position is, these are questions for Charles's charities, which are independent organisations run by their trustees. So their basic position is that Charles knew nothing about the honours deal. 
he has and, and all uh, sort of legal and fiduciary responsibility falls on the trustees. So basically, ask somebody else, but not us. Well, let's some focus on that then. And there is now a police investigation into the suggestion of uh, an honour being given as a result of uh, donations. Norman Baker is a former uh, Liberal Democrat MP and former minister. He's author of the, uh, What the Royal Family Don't Want You to Know. And uh, Norman, uh, you, uh, Norman joins me now. Norman, you wrote to the police calling them to look into exactly this. Yes, indeed, Matt, because um, it seemed clear to me from the letter that was published in the Sunday Times and the Mail on Sunday, there was a prima facie evidence that an offence had been committed under the 1925 Honours Act in that uh, an honour and indeed help with citizenship application had been offered explicitly, it seemed to me, in return for uh, money for Prince Charles's good causes. And the Metropolitan Police then subsequently wrote back to me and said, we are now beginning a criminal investigation and that, as far as I'm aware, is continuing. And it's relevant that you bring that up because, as has just been said by Gabriel, the, the, the response from Clarence Household, which is not me, Gov, I don't deal with these matters, Prince Charles says, it's done by some flunky somewhere, uh, I sail above it all. Well, of course, that defence, to my mind, has been shot through by the fact that Prince Charles was caught, to use a vernacular, red-handed, receiving bags of money in Fort the Mason carriers uh, from the former Qatari Prime Minister. And now we know that um, uh, he's been uh, engaged in the same direct way with Lord Brownlow, uh, according to Sunday Times front page, in terms of money for Dumfries House. It seems very clear that Prince Charles is intimately involved with these matters. I'm interested, Norman, in the in the fact that when Lord Brownlow was involved in paying or not paying for Boris Johnson's wallpaper, w Westminster was alive with calls for investigations and <laughs> resignations and, you know, the Labour Party were all over it and Conservative critics of Boris Johnson were all over it. And, it, you know, the, the story was given endless legs by, um, uh, by interventions by politicians. This time round, Gable does extraordinary work week after week in the Sunday Times. It is met by... Total silence from the Westminster yeah. establishment, and I know I know you're you're not an MP anymore. But were you? Did you feel when you were an MP under pressure not to speak out about what the royal family were up to? Well, I mean, there should be uh, voices in Parliament, not least of all because the uh, donations in question, Lord Brownlow and the Qatari Prime Minister, were not included in the talk, in the court circular, and therefore a distinct attempt was made to hush them up very clearly. But look, I mean, in 18 years I was in Parliament, I think I was the only member of Parliament to initiate a debate on anything to do with the royal family, which was, I had to link it, so they make it very difficult for you, I had to link it back to the obscure Treasury paper in 1993 in order to get it past the House of Commons clerks. But the wider point is this, MPs, many of whom are Republican in nature, I might tell you, particularly in the Labour and Lib Dem groups, don't think it's a, a matter to be raised because they think it's either a vote loser or as a distraction or be painted as some sort of extremist. Now, for they keep their head down, they say it's more important to do with A, B and C. That's where they are. Uh, actually, this is very important because this is about our constitution. This is about the future monarch in terms of Prince Charles. It's about how public money is spent. And uh, my view has always been that those who are receiving public money, whether it's MPs, councillors, people in the health service, or, or anybody else, network rail, they should be held publicly accountable. And the public accountability for Prince Charles and the royal family is woefully inadequate, not least of all because Prince Charles lobbied the government to exclude the royal family as far as possible from the Freedom of Information Act. We should, you talk about how difficult it is even to mention the royal family. This was the, the other day, Keir Starmer mentioned the Queen at uh, joined PMQs and the Common Speaker Lindsay Hoyle intervened. Yes. We normally would not... Sorry, Premier. We normally would not, and quite rightly, mention the royal family. Even the very mention of the royal family is is yeah. is found on. Never mind, you know, saying, "Well, I'm not sure if the heir to the throne should be receiving money in carrier bags." Well, look, I mean, at any one time, the minimum percentage of the population that's Republican is twenty percent. It goes up to about forty-five percent. It, 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 it ebbs and flows between those two figures. But if you take twenty percent of the House of Commons, that's about one hundred and twenty, one hundred and thirty MPs. How many actually say anything at all about the royal family? Well, Chris Bryant does occasionally, and that's it, uh, I'm afraid. And, you know, we're not representing, uh, the, the MPs are not representing the public properly by failing to address these issues. There are huge sums of money involved, as well as propriety issues, and uh, the MPs ought to be really far more involved. I'll be writing shortly to Meg Hillier, the chair of the Public Accounts Committee, because 
there are so many issues about royal finance that to be looked at. But where's the Public Accounts Committee on this? Nowhere. Yeah. Norman Baker's really good to speak to you. Final word to Gabriel Pogrant. Uh, where does the story go next? Do, well, do, if you, do you have more, more, of, more of these cases to wade through, these hundreds of documents you're looking at? We do. Um, I don't think uh, I don't know that you'll see anything uh, imminent, but there's there is more, and I think we just need to see where this Met investigation goes. I mean, there are investigations by the Met, the charity regulator, the Scottish charity regulator. I think there are about six of them right now. So we'll have to see if they are actually going to if these investigations will have bite, uh, or, or or whether they'll sort of defer to the establishment as these things um, of, often turn out to be. But um, we'll see. 